Hello everybody, welcome back to Fanblade, where we are coming down off the uh, glorious highs of having made an instrument and having it actually work first time. Now we come to the, the crushing reality that I have to take it all apart and do a whole lot of sanding. Ugh, that's no fun, but it's got to be done because all, all the edges are very, very sharp, like around the side of the fingerboard, it's like it's all just needs to be cleaned up a lot uh, and just made to look nice and then we can finish it. Are the... Uh, the other thing that I said in the last video was that I was thinking of staining the fingerboard and uh, possibly making the bridge out of some uh, a much lighter material. Uh, traditionally they're made out of maple, I don't have any, otherwise I'd use that. Um, I've got quite a lot of oak over there, uh, which should more than be more than um, sturdy enough for a bridge. Um, but uh, one commenter in particular, David Murray Holland, thank you sir. He suggested that uh, I ebonize the fingerboard using a mixture of steel, wool, and vinegar. And I've never done this before. I had to look it up. Turns out it's dead simple, and I really want to give it a go. Because all you need is some steel wool, and you dissolve it in some vinegar. Preferably in a glass jar. So, uh, because this actually takes a while for the chemical reaction to happen, gonna start off by doing that and we'll keep uh, we'll keep a close eye on it over the course of everything else uh, but now I believe it's literally just a case of popping a couple of these in there pouring some vinegar in if I can get it open I'm gonna test this on some scrap because I want to make sure that the whole thing is not just gonna stink of vinegar because I don't particularly enjoy the smell but right to the top and I'm not screwing the lid down tight because there's uh, probably some gases going to build up in there but uh, yes yeah, so that's just sitting on there loose I'm going to set that on a shelf over there and uh, we'll check in on it periodically and see if it's doing anything interesting in the meantime however I've got a base to disassemble I'm going to be very careful when I'm taking the strings off because uh, I, I'm unfamiliar with the hardiness of double bass strings and they cost a lot of money I certainly don't want to bend, twist, kink or otherwise damage anything so uh, just be a little bit careful getting the strings off I have to uncurl all of this and pull them through a straight hole yeah it's just going to be a little bit uh, a little bit fiddly And here we are a couple of days later, the neck and the body are both sanded out to 240. They are ready for their final finish. Uh, I had to cut a little bit of a, a chamfer on that edge there, just so that the strings have a little bit more clearance, particularly the E and G strings. It's been about 72 hours, and my jar of pickled steel wool is looking particularly manky. 
let's have a closer look. It's a little bit hard to show on camera because it just looks like a dark mess, but there's uh, plenty of air bubbles in there, there's lots of gases been escaping, there's plenty of sediment at the bottom, but there's a lot of rust floating on top. Uh, it looks pretty awful, actually, <laughs> if I'm completely honest. But uh, the chemistry has happened. We've had a chemical reaction, and I believe what we have in this jar is a solution of ferric acetate. When you pull the ferric acetate solution and put it on any wood that's high in tannins, it reacts with the tannins and stains this black. This is not black. This is not going to... we're not painting the wood. We are causing a chemical reaction in the wood. Uh, and it's really cool. I've done a couple of tests. Allow me to demonstrate. I'm going to try and get some liquid that's not got all the brown rusty crud floating in it. Uh, I'm going to squeeze that, dip in, and here we have, with the aside from a little, a few little brown bits on the end, we have basically clear liquid. When I put it on here, you're going to see some interesting stuff happen. There's a chemical reaction about to take place. And it'll probably work better if I actually smear that around a little bit. The wood is starting to darken. But, here's an interesting trick. When you have a chemical reaction, it invariably generates heat. And if you apply heat to a chemical reaction, it invariably speeds it up. So heat gun. I should say as well, this is happening in real time. Let's get the last little wet bits. And there you have ebonized quiller. You can actually do a second coat as well, it'll make that even darker. So that's effectively what we're doing. We are doing chemistry. <laughs> uh, gonna do the fingerboard, I'm gonna mask off the rest of the neck because I don't want the whole neck to be black and I don't, I'm not sure exactly how much leaching I'm going to get. Uh, so I'm going to mask off the bits of the neck that I don't want blackened and then just do exactly what you've seen here. I'll probably do a couple of coats to try and get it as deep as possible and then I can uh, slap some CA glue on there to stabilise the fingerboard uh, and some CA glue on the rest of it to finish it. Yeah, going to work nicely. Right, that's had three coats now. Uh, it sort of wants to come off on your fingers. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it's interesting. I think we've raised a little bit of the grain as well. Not so much. We probably would have raised more if I'd just gone for a straight super glue finish. Um, and I suspect that when we put some glue on this, then a lot of this black stuff is going to come off anyway. I've got a little bit on the headstock, but it should just sand out. It's only just on the surface. I'm just going to try and brush as much of the as much of the sort of powdery blackness off as I can. Yeah, like I think that'll be fine. I think that's ready for uh, ready for some super glue to go on there. Um, I hope too much of it hasn't leached in underneath the masking tape. But uh, as I say, it's just on the surface. We can sand it out and clean it up and make it look uh, uh, nice and pristine. Like I'm loving the way that that looks. I think the third coat uh, really really made it black. So yeah, let's uh, glove up. I'll put some super glue on it and we'll see how it looks. And there it is. 
Um, uh, it'll take a few more coats of super glue, I'm sure. The entire thing is going to get plenty more. I've got a little bit on the headstock there, but that will sand out. Um, and yeah, so that is how you ebonize wood, using steel wool and vinegar. Alright, this has had a few coats now. Um, I need to pull the masking tape off before I go any further because there's a danger that I'm going to actually wind up sealing the, the masking tape onto the wood. So this is the moment of truth to see how clean a line I got and uh, see, well, basically how it's going to look. Right, aside from a couple of little bits of uh, little bits of cleanup, I think that's actually more that's more masking tape than stain, but that's just beautiful. <laughs> I, I, I really couldn't be happier with that. That's fantastic. I love that. Um, your eagle-eyed viewers will notice, of course, the fingerboard is thicker at this end than it is at this end. It's actually not. It's because the radius is uh, so extreme uh, and that was actually drawn into the plan I sort of knew that that was going to happen so that's why uh, the fingerboard is sort of the way it is but that's that just looks exactly like I, just, I couldn't ask for that to be better really I could not ask for that to be better um, gotta just clean up the last little bits of masking tape that are sort of glued on there uh, and then I can sort of sand the whole thing and blend it in what I actually need to do first is start finishing the body and I can't do that until I've made a little recess for the strings to go through because double bass strings are real expensive and if the ball ends are just sticking out the back it's only a matter of time before one of them gets sheared off <laughs> and that's that's game over it's another whole pile of money for another set of strings so I'm gonna recess these I've got to make a little plate Hold that thought, slight change of plan. I was going to use a 25mm force in a bit to uh, cut a recess through there, but as you can see, there's nothing left on this edge. It's all end grain, they'll just bust straight off. Uh, there's really no way I can get a piece of 25mm bar in there to be a plate. Um, uh, but then I realised I have the solution right in front of me. The neck bolts are sitting in these washers, which I bought at the hardware store. I've got a lot of them. I see no reason why I can't just chuck four of them in there. That's going to work as well as anything that I would spend another oh, hour and a half making and recessing uh, just to drill four holes. Path of least resistance. And just like that, body and neck are both ready for their final finish. Yeah, uh, gotta clear the bench, put a towel down and uh, set myself up because it is super glue time. Just like that, it's done. It's fully polished, fully finished, fully buffed out, and uh, it's looking amazing. Check out that neck. That's just lovely. <laughs> the next step is that uh, I need to 
find, uh, figure out a way to mount this on a stand. And to that end, I've actually been shopping. This is a projector stand. That bit, you know, does that. Um, it is made of solid steel because magnets will stick to it. Uh, it is nice and robust. It's a very sturdy stand. If it fails, it'll be because of the cheap plastic uh, brackets and I'm even just looking at the rivets that are holding the brackets in and thinking, nah, <laughs> that's not going to last very long. So I might have to uh, put something, uh, put a bit, bit more reinforcing in there. But I need to mount this on this. And the way I'm going to do it is simply taking a Dremel and uh, cutting this big plate off uh, which will leave me with this bracket here and then I'm going to put some tea nuts set them into the pocket there and then I've got some screws that'll go in through the bracket from the back and hold the whole thing together uh, it is generally not recommended to drill things into the neck pocket of any instrument you run a risk of a loss of sustain well on an upright base i'm actually looking to even pack foam into the bridge because i, I i'm perfectly happy to lose a little bit of sustain because that's the sound we're after so uh yes also uh just making a note i, I would have much preferred to have one giant m20 uh, T nut in there as opposed to two M8s, I, but that's this is all I could buy, so this is the solution that I'm going for. So, uh, gonna set them in, gotta drill them into the correct depth because the uh, handles that I've got aren't all that long, so I'm gonna have to do some careful measuring. But the important thing is that as this screws in from the back of the body, that the top of the screw does not come anywhere near actually running into the neck. So uh, yes, I'm going to do this carefully, but I think this is going to work well. And, and then that's literally the last thing I need to do. I can put it all together, put some strings on it, and then start making a bridge, get some piezo pickups on there, and yeah, like it's going to be ready to play, and I think it's going to be, I think it's going to work out nicely. I'm hoping, anyway. So this steel is a lot tougher than I thought it was, these little cutoff wheels are just disintegrating. Luckily, my father-in-law's on his way, and I'm pretty sure he'll be bringing his grinder with him. Just like that, I've got a bracket that, aside from the post in the way, <laughs> yeah, there we go. Right, that's 
yeah, that is very firmly attached. Uh, cool. Yes, we're going to put it together, put some strings on it. Uh, I still need to make a bridge, but I'll sort of do that when I've got some strings on so I can judge the uh, uh, how the action's looking. Uh, I'm toying with the idea of making a two-part bridge with an, with an adjustable screw. Um, not just yet. That's an upgrade I can make later. Well, uh, here it is. It's in tune. <laughs> the uh, the neck has got a tiny little bit of front bow on it. The bridge could probably come down just a tad more, but right now I want to mount it on its stand. The thing that hadn't really occurred to me is just the sheer size of this thing. There's nowhere in the garage or the studio where I can get the camera far away enough that I can get the entire thing in shot, so please enjoy this shot of me standing next to it outside. Yeah, it's that big. And there it is, dead simple, piezo pickup, bit of leather for padding, a wooden strip to clamp it all down, and a bulldog clip cut in half to clamp it all together, just going to a simple piece of aluminium with a jack on it. 
Um, let's go to the studio and see how it sounds. Well, that clearly didn't work. I was hoping to be able to dress that up with a little bit of EQ, maybe a bit of compression, maybe just make it sound sort of nice for YouTube, but there's no saving that. That's awful. Um, I'm going to have to make a custom pickup for this one. That will be in the next video. I'm also going to have to do something about the stand because it's a little bit wobbly. I don't really trust it. If I want to do any vibrato, then the whole thing sort of moves as I'm trying to manipulate the neck the whole thing's moving with me I just it's I'm not used to it I don't know how much of it is me not being used to it and how much of it is the stand just being bad so we've got things to work on uh, I will try and address these issues in the next video uh, but until then thank you very much for watching thank you very much for subscribing special thanks to my father-in-law for the angle grinder and I'll see you next time cheers